Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this CEDA live stream on resetting the Federation uh, for recovery and reform. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Melinda Salento. I'm the CEO of CEDA, uh, and it's great to have you joining us today for this live stream. Like so many organisations, we've shifted um, uh, our events to digital events um, through the COVID crisis. It's been really a great opportunity for us, I think, to reach a broader audience. And we've been really thrilled by the participation uh, that we've seen in our events and really glad that you can uh, join us today for this fantastic conversation. Um, can I start by acknowledging uh, that we meet on the land of um, Aboriginal peoples. Um, I'm here in Melbourne on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I'd like to pay my uh, respects um, to their elders, past, pre present and emerging. Um, we are, of course, going to be talking about the Federation today. Um, and one of the biggest challenges across our Federation is, in fact, how we manage um, better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, it's been an issue which state and federal governments have been tackling for a long time. And so I think as we talk about some of the structures that may be more or less effective, perhaps we can keep in our minds that when we talk about these things, they actually um, have a real purpose and outcome at the end of them. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge um, our newest uh, uh, Senator, uh, Lydia Thorpe, um, and wish her all the very best. She is, of course, a proud um, Aboriginal woman and I'm sure is going to represent the, the aspirations um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people strongly uh, in the Senate. Um, uh, as is the, the way we operate these live stream events, we obviously want to encourage our audience um, to be involved. And you can do that through um, the Pigeonhole app, which allows you to ask questions of our participants uh, in the conversation today. Um, you can click on the link below the video um, on your screen, um, or alternatively, uh, go to cedar.pigeonhole.at. The password for today's event is just the word federation. Um, if you're going to enjoy, enjoy um, social media and, and engaging in social media throughout the conversation, we obviously like to encourage you to do that. Uh, and the hashtag for today's conversation is hashtag coming back better. Uh, and of course, we always like it if you can tag us in there at cedar underscore news. So I think that's me covering off on all the key uh, admin issues. Um, as I was saying earlier, our conversation today is looking at, at the Federation and, and how we think it's operating and how we can improve it. As we think about the really critical reform issues before us, it seems clear that almost all of them are going to involve um, all levels of government. Uh, and we're going to need to work better together if we can actually get the outcomes that we're going to need. We've seen through the COVID uh, crisis itself uh, a, a level of um, cooperation and collaboration, um, which uh, has been perhaps standout, if you like, based on what we've seen in recent years. And I think that will be a, a really important starting point for our conversation today. Joining me today in this conversation, we have the Honourable John Brumby AO, who uh, was, of course, the Premier of Victoria from 2007 to 2010 and is currently also the Chancellor of La Trobe University. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Melinda. And Jenny Menzies, who is the Principal Research Fellow for the Policy Innovation Hub at Griffith uh, University. Um, both uh, Griffith and La Trobe are members of CEDA, so we're always grateful for your uh, support and your participation. And just before I get you onto the first question, I should also mention that we've got a poll running on our Pigeonhole app. We always like to get your perspective on issues, so please jump into there and um, give us your views on the poll question. So um, without uh, any further commentary from me, perhaps we'll jump straight into our conversation. Obviously, one of the things that has been the focus of quite a bit of conversation and, and debate, if you like, is, is how Australia has responded to the COVID crisis, and in particular, the establishment of the National Cabinet and, and how we think that's, that's performed um, Jenny, maybe I'll start with you, uh, with you know, for your perspectives on, on the, that topic. Um, what I think is interesting is Australians are actually good in a crisis, and once again, our, our leadership kind of stepped up in this crisis. But I think about the national cabinet. There's a number of things. Um, one important thing was that we actually already had the structures in place. So the chief 
medical of officials met together regularly, as did the premiers and the prime minister, um, through COAG. So we're not like the United States or the UK to a certain extent that didn't have structures that they could quickly plug into. Um, I think there was respect for jurisdictional capability and the fact that we were a federation. You don't always get that in Commonwealth state relations. So I, I think that the fact that they had set a framework and then allowed the different jurisdictions to implement it at a time that met their local needs was a very a sound way of going through. Um, the politicians and the leaders seem to ditch partisanship and their ideological baggage, and people really appreciated that. Um, and they changed to a problem-solving mentality and just put all that one to one side. Um, I think another reason it was effective was it, the issue it was dealing with was something that everyone um, had a buy-in to a certain extent. And what the National Cabinet did was put some of its thinking on display in a way that we don't normally see through these intergovernmental forums. So people understood the objective, which initially was to flatten the curve so the hospitals could prepare. They saw the modelling. They now know the phase um, that, that we're in. So those thinkings and trade-offs were made uh, public and it kind of displayed in a way some of the complex decision-making and trade-offs that political leaders have to do on a regular basis that the public aren't privy to. And um, and so I think there was some, not sympathy, but there was an understanding. These, these people are dealing with difficult issues. We can understand what the issues are and we appreciate the way they're going around it, about it. And I think there's just a couple of nuts and bolts things I might mention. They're just guided by research and technical advice, very sound. Um, they met frequently, which is something COAG doesn't do, and we can get back to that, and there was a limited agenda. So all of this, I think, mm. brought together and made it successful. John, how about you? Do you think those are sort of the key, the key issues of its success? Um, well, my, my response would be very similar, actually, to, to Jenny's. Um, so there's probably six or seven things that are, that are on my list. Uh, and and I would agree with Jenny that that Australians um, Australian governments not always but generally and the Australian people um, usually respond well in a crisis and and so this was a crisis you know we saw this post GFC as well um, we've seen it with uh, other pandemics I mean we saw it uh, other health crises we saw it with AIDS going right back in the 80s when I was in federal parliament generally. Um, governments respond well. And as Jenny said, the interesting thing too about how they responded this time, it was really um, text textbook response. And textbook response in a crisis is, is openness and transparency and sharing information and taking the people with you. And, and they did all that. And the Prime Minister's done that and the state premiers have done that. So, so I think that's the, the first thing. It's, it's a crisis and they've responded well in a crisis. Uh, but I, some of the other things I'd put on my list um, uh, was a great example of evidence-based policy. So um, uh, I'm a great believer in evidence-based policy and, and the best governments um, apply evidence-based policy. And as Jenny said, the structures were in place through the Commonwealth and state um, uh, health officers, and so that structure was there. Um, decisions were based on science and best evidence, and that's come through. And I think it's why, principally, why Australia has done so much better uh, than the rest of the world in tackling COVID. Uh, third factor, I'd say, is um, uh, less chest beating. Uh, I think, um, ironically, in in many ways, the 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 effect of COVID has meant that. Face-to-face um, -face meetings haven't been possible, so they've all been virtual, and that means that the the chest beating, the walk that you often saw the premiers do uh, in the way to Parliament House in Canberra, where they'd stop and do the doorstop and you know beat, beat their chest and and talk about their state interests, um, that hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened because there is no doorstop beforehand, there is no walking through the media, uh, so. Uh, I think that's been a big factor. And I've often written about this as saying one of the things that I think really undermined COAG was this politicisation and chest beating before the meetings uh, started place, took place. 
the fourth thing I'd put on my list, Jenny mentioned, again, jurisdictional flexibility. You know, one of the great strengths of our federation, when it works at its best, it's got jurisdictional uh, flexibility. And um, uh, the National Cabinet set the broad policy agenda and the states have had the flexibility to uh, to implement uh, that. Um, so they'd, they'd be the, the key thing. And, and I suppose finally sort of shared shared leadership. It hasn't all been the prime minister. It's been it's been shared Again, uh, there hasn't been the partisanship we've seen in the past. So, so it's all worked well, but I think it's, it's worked well for a raft of reasons. Um, and the test, of course, as we'll talk about later, will be you know, what happens when, when COVID's sort of done and dusted or we've learned to live with COVID, what happens in the medium and longer term with this arrangement and, and what are the necessary preconditions to make it work? There's an, there is so much in uh, the responses that you've both just given. Um, obviously, I think where people are now shifting their attention is how do we take the lessons from what's happened so well in this experience for, and, and all of the things that, that you both have just spoken to and how do we play those forward into the future, whether it's National Cabinet, whether it's uh, Whatever, not a, no one wants to say coag again. I think I, I, I was did a session the other day with Peter Harris, who who talked about coag being the place where all good ideas go to die. Um, so I don't think anyone wants that again. But, but let me put this question to you, as we sort of then, and we can take it into what what was good or not good about coag. But some of the things that you've both mentioned, I'm as a policy person, I would have thought, gee, didn't did that really not happen in coag? You know, evidence based. <laughs> um, clear objectives um, and even you know some of the things that you started off with Jenny around the community had buy-in and I absolutely agree because we've had one simple aspiration or objective through this but you look at the COAG agendas of the past and, and look at the issues they were tackling you would have thought community had buy-in to those issues so so why why didn't they in a practical sense so you know I think there's so many things that are high level you've ticked off and and people would have maybe thought that that was happening in COAG. So what do you think is different this time around and what, what are the lessons that we need to take out of this for better uh, cross-jurisdictional decision-making in the future? Yeah. Can, I, can I have a crack at that? Um, I mean, I think I think with COAG, I was a great believer in COAG, you know, and, I, and I've always been, as you know, Melinda, a, a, you know, a great believer in the Federation and, 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 and the power of the Federation to work together uh, cooperatively, but I think the truth is in recent years. So, so your question is really what what went wrong with Coag, um, and I think it was failing. That's the, that's the truth. Could it have been revived? Uh, it probably could have been revived with a different a different set of rules and a different agenda. And we'll come to that in a moment. But um, it 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 had lost its relevance and it wasn't working. So why was that? Uh, I think over the last decade we've had a lot of prime ministers. And there have been varying degrees of commitment from those prime ministers to to a to a national body, uh, and you know I won't go into names, but I think some have been um, very strong supporters of the federation and and a national cabinet or a coag. Um, others have been um, less supportive. So I think it, it didn't have the sort of political will at the top to survive um, in, in its present form. Um, I think secondly, there wasn't a clear agenda. You know, I've written a lot about this, uh, particularly, you know, I'm out of politics now 10 years. I chair a lot of boards in the for-profit, not-for-profit sector. One of the things we, you know, we do in every board every year, we have two to three days set aside for strategy. We have a clear medium term agenda and it's strategic and we map it out. So if it's a big issue, if it's about energy or it's about productivity, it's on our forward agenda. And I think COAG, you know, particularly after the election, the Abbott government, it, 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 it just lost its direction. You know, it didn't have a clear agenda. Uh, I think, if, you know, it failed too because it it became more of a political tool. Again, this, this sort of chest beating thing, uh, we saw prime ministers use it in a political way. Prime ministers put things on the agenda literally the night before, and then the states use it as an opportunity for a bit of breastfeeding. Uh, there was no ownership by the states. They didn't have a big enough say in the forward agenda um, of COAG, so there was no shared Commonwealth state um, ownership. 
And I think the other thing is, you know, post GFC, uh, Coe did work well. You know, when when uh, Kevin Rudd and then subsequently Julia Gillard as Prime Minister, um, I think COAG did work well. And that's why Australia was one of the very few countries in the world to get through the GFC uh, without going into recession. Because, but, but it had a clear purpose then, you know, clear agenda and clear purpose to go to your question. But one of the things that Kevin did was add the treasurers in, which I think was right at the time because so much of it was economic. But, but I think in the longer term, there were too many in COAG. You know, I think that should have been a, you know, a two-year sort of post-GFC placement. And there were too, too many heads. It became too big, too cumbersome in terms of making decisions. And, and so I think, you know, I would, have, I, I would have probably removed the treasurers and got it down to a, to a smaller body. And I think when you put all of those things together, um, you, you know, it made it a, it lost its relevance to go to your question. So, Jenny, I will come back. I will come to you for your perspectives on this. But, um, John, if I can just ask you um, a follow-up question on this issue of the GFC. Um, so, basically, COAG worked well through that process. Um, you know, I think, and, and I was going to ask you about this because you're obviously premier during that um, mm. during that process. It, do you think we can only get these <laughs> these levels of government working well in a crisis? Uh, no, I, I think, you know, the, we're, we're, hopefully we'll come to this a bit later about what are the essential ingredients to make to make a national cabinet or a COAG, um, uh, you know, a federation council, whatever you want to call it, w work best. But the key thing for me is, is you've got to have a clear agenda. And um, where you've got a clear, so you've got a clear agenda with COVID-19, there's a clear agenda. That's to get to get the health policy right and to get the economy right and to try and find the balance between the two. Post GFC, it was to get the economy going. And when you look at where COAG has worked best, and, and COAG did some great things, when you look at where it worked best over its, what was it, 15 or 20 year history, whatever it was, um, it did some great things. You know, competition policy. You know, Paul Keating took competition policy to COAG, 95 to 2005. Uh, I was treasurer through half of that period. Competition policy, not everyone loved it. It wasn't a vote winner, but it was a great thing for Australia in terms of um, preparing our economy for the big challenges ahead. Uh, when John Howard was Prime Minister, the, the GST and tax reform agenda could never have been implemented. Uh, sure, he took it to the election in 98, but the mechanics of it, much of that fell to the states. And so, again, it was a great example of the Federation working at its best. And then when I think of the national reform agenda, the third wave of national reform really kicked off uh, by Victoria and then picked up in part first by Prime Minister Howard and then in much more embraced by um, Prime Minister Rudd. That was a fantastic agenda, which looked at human capital, investment in human capital um, and uh, productivity reforms and regulation reform. Uh, and I think that was co and, th and then on top of that, of course, you had the GFC and you had Howard with the guns, you know, so, so where there's a clear purpose, uh, co works well or National Cabinet works well. And so for me, as I've written about often, the most fundamental thing, I think, whatever structure you've got in place is to have a very clear forward agenda and not just have a meeting at the Prime Minister of the day's whim. It's got to be a clear forward strategic agenda. Jenny, what, what are your key takeouts? On, uh, John, John's covered a lot there, but you'll have some clear views about, you know, how you think, what, what are the lessons from the COAG experience and, and what we should try to extract from that, whether it's a national cabinet or whatever process going forward. I, I must say I agree with everything that John, John said. Um, you won't be surprised to know there's a kind of a rich vein of academic criticism around COAG. Um, and a lot of it is around, and this is the issues John has spoken about, but it's around Commonwealth dominance and the fact that it waxes and wanes at the whim of the Prime Minister. Um, so, and this kind of leads to a whole lot of coercive practices and, uh, and a whole lot of strange kind of... Uh, cultural elements from the Commonwealth. So the, the Prime Minister sets the agenda. So you end up with issues that are important to the Commonwealth, not the states, which was the point kind of, kind of John, John made. And because of the extreme um, fertile fiscal imbalance in Australia, uh, 
the states can be brought to the table uh, because of the financial clout of the federal government. So you end up with, um, instead of a cooperative federalism, what some academics have turned a cooperative centralism. So we'll, we'll cooperate with the states and territories as long as you centralise and do what you want us to do. Um, and I think there's a lot of lack of a federal culture. And I have worked both in the Commonwealth and states. So in the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth really thinks it does no best. And then the states are just an impediment um, to their rolling out of their plans. And I think, Melinda, the issue you were talking about before about well, why haven't people been engaged with these important issues that have been on the COAG agenda, um, I think a lot of it is because it became so transactionally based that the premiers turned up and, as John said, all did the work, walked through the media and, you know, the new health agreements were being re renegotiated or whatever, so they all put their positions, became very transactional. Um, and the only media story you ever get out of COAG is the, is the conflict in the lead-up to COAG as the different state and territory leaders put their position. And, of course, we all know that kind of endless politicking puts people off. So I think that's... COAG suffered from that. Um, yeah. So I think, um, and I also think there's an issue around um, churn, churn of leadership. So every year uh, you would have at least one or two state leaders or the prime minister going through an election. Um, leaders change all the time. They go into caretaker. They can't participate in COAG. Um, so you have all of these issues that have gone on the agenda that seemed important to the, that cohort of leaders at the time. They change over rapidly and then it just becomes an administrative exercise. So the new leaders are saying all these issues are coming back to COAG um, and people, the new leaders aren't sure why they're, why they're an issue, you know, and they have little engagement with progressing it. And I think that was the criticism that came out that the premiers were making as part of the National Cabinet thing, saying it just got too bureaucratic for them. And you can understand how that, that accretion happens. I'm going to just ask one quick question, if I could, um, re related to the, uh, how decisions are made too within, within the structure. Uh, John, I think you called out early on that um, decisions in the National Cabinet around the COVID crisis have been based on um, fact and evidence. I think actually both of you mentioned this point. And again, I would have thought, if anything, you know, the COAG process was one where there was just a tremendous amount of work that sort of went into some of the topics at least and a lot of fact and a lot of evidence, but it doesn't seem to necessarily have resulted in people thinking that the decision-making, the progress that came out of it was fact-based or evidence-based. Is that, is that a fair sort of summary? Um, well, look, only in, in part, I mean, I... I you know, the time I was um, on COAG, uh, you know, generally, you know, you've got an agenda, as Jenny said, and the agenda will be set by the Prime Minister. But for many of the things that are on that agenda, they won't be contentious. You know, so so it's what you do with the contentious ones. But, uh, you know, inevitably where COAG failed, it was because of the politicisation, I think, of, of issues. And... And if I might say one, you know, which was close to my heart, um, you know, health health reform. Uh, this was when Kevin was prime minister. We had two COAG meetings, and um, at my instigation, uh, we shared across the states best practice in health about how we make our health system work better. And I thought we had a great understanding about shared practices and uh, opportunities for improvement in the system nationally. And we'd had those two meetings and then it's only a couple of weeks after the second meeting and we all thought it was really going well and I'm in the car one morning, I've just made a speech and and Kevin rings me up and says, oh, um, I just wanted to give you a courtesy call. I'll be announcing this morning that the Commonwealth is intending to take over the state health system and to take 30% of your GST. And I sort of said, hello, am I, you know, like, am I really talking to Kevin Rudd or is this an impersonator? And anyway, that's where the conversation finished. And so when I look back at that, I think about a process that worked really well. And then for reasons I've never understood, um, you know, it got sabotaged. And I've written about this and I still don't know what the motivation of, of the then Prime Minister was. 
Um, so I put that down to sort of lack of discipline and really lack of respect for the states. Um, so, um, and I think this culture thing is really important, Melinda, without dwelling on it, but I know when, uh, you know, I'd left politics and uh, Julia was Prime Minister, I was in an airport lounge one day and I'm watching COAG and I saw the then Chief Minister of the Northern Territory front up for a meeting in Canberra and what he said outside that meeting about the Prime Minister, I thought any of the boards I chair, if any director had ever said that about the chair of the board, they would have been dismissed by, by unanimous vote of all of the other directors. You just don't tolerate that um, uh, attitude and culture. And, and uh, perhaps it's a tangential point, but, uh, and again, I've written about this often, I think in politics, there's still a fair way to go in, in culture, in improving culture. Uh, and you see that portrayed so regularly, the sort of poor behaviours of our politicians. And again, sometimes you saw that displayed in COAG and so it, it dragged down what would otherwise be, you know, a, a good discussion about evidence-based policy. Jenny, thoughts from you on how well COAG used evidence or how we can embed um, actually a return to, I, and I think it is genuinely a return to more evidence-based policy making. It's interesting because there's actually two processes around COAG, as John will well know. You have the kind of senior officials who take the negotiations to a certain level and then about, you know, a week or so before COAG or whatever, it tra transitions to a kind of a political uh, bargaining, negotiating kind of structure. So a lot of the, the COAG process are totally driven by, by evidence base. Um, you know, there's detailed reports are commissioned, uh, all the states and territories contribute. Um, but then when it goes into what COAG became, which is this transactional ne negotiation bargaining thing, that gets put, put aside. And you see that with things like, um, you know, the new education degree agreements or whatever, there's like the Gonski stuff, there's all this evidence. And then suddenly the Commonwealth will start picking off different states and territories for different deals. So that's where it seems to fall apart. It's a, it's a proper evidence-based process till then, <laughs> and then we get into the kind of negotiation. <laughs> oh, I'm going to come back and ask a question about the roles that states working together can play um, if we if we have time. But let, let me turn to um, let me turn to the issue of leadership. You've both mentioned it. Um, you, you've both talked about it, particularly in the sense of the extent to which the prime minister of the day actually owns and honours, I, I think, um, the process. Um, I think the, the leadership issue has been quite interesting to see through National Cabinet. And, and actually, John, you know, you said you're a firm believer of the Federation, as am I, and I think this is another example of where having different perspectives across the Federation actually works. Because yeah. I think if you go back to the beginning of this crisis, there were a number of premiers who had a different risk appetite for want of a better description at least seemingly um, in the public narrative. And then all of a sudden we sort of seem to get a coalescing around uh, an agreed position. And I, I think that came out better as a result of having different differences in opinion early on. Um, but so t talk to me a little bit about the role that you see leadership playing, particularly around this um, national cabinet and in through this crisis. Jenny, how important do you think the prime minister's role has been and how has it worked with the leadership of the premiers? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting observation about um, Commonwealth state relations. I don't think a, it's never top of mind for prime ministers when they get elected and they, they often get dragged kicking and screaming uh, to the table when there's a crisis and they suddenly have to engage with the states because they need them to implement something. And you kind of, you see Scott Morrison go on this journey uh, during, during this crisis where he starts and I think he thinks he can manage it all. And, and then there's that fateful day they have the COAG meeting and the chief health officers are reporting throughout. Um, and so it's, so I think it's, it's a hard for, for someone like a prime minister to have more of a dispersed leadership model, so we, we give him uh, credit for that. But in a large federated country like Australia, you just can't do this stuff centrally. And, and all the, the executive power around... Um, managing the health crisis all sits 
within the state governments. So I think they've all stepped up. I think they've worked incredibly hard and well as a cohort. I think um, it, it helps that they're meeting so frequently. So they've, they've been able to get used to each other's styles. And I think that the lesson uh, for all of our leaders out of it is they've all had hugely increased political capital. Uh, their popularity is soared. So hopefully that, that lesson will kind of sink home. People like seeing leaders cooperate and work together. John? Well, um, I think Jenny said it all. And, and again, that's, that's generally what you see um, through a crisis. Um, and you see leaders rise to the occasion. And, and, you know, we've done very well in Australia, and it doesn't matter what side of politics you're on, um, there's uh, strong support for our political leaders because they put, they put partisanship aside. Uh, they put cheap political shots aside. As I said, I think the structure of the National Cabinet where there are virtual meetings has probably assisted with that. So there's no sort of side chatter or backgrounding of the media. Um, and um, so, so they've risen to the occasion, you know, and, that, and as I said, it's been really classic textbook crisis management about sharing information and taking the public with you on a, on a journey about tackling a big challenge. I think the other thing that's important is you, though you do need, whether it's a COAG or a national cabinet, you've got to have the basis of some strong personal relationships or understandings. And I think, again, the Prime Minister and uh, I think the Victorian Premier, um, Daniel Andrews, that they've worked together very closely. Um, I'm sure they don't agree on everything, uh, but they've worked closely. You haven't seen any personal shots at each other, really, for the whole course of this year, notwithstanding. You know, they've probably had differences of emphasis about when to open schools and things like that, but they've worked together in a much more collegiate um, way in a much more cooperative way um, and much more in the way that a company board or a not-for-profit board would work together rather than making it political. And I think there's a lesson in that for all of our politicians. And as Jenny said, the public love it. The public love it when they see the political leaders at their best. I think, you know, one of the things that I think you've both touched on as well is this issue of a, a clear objective. And I think what what has played out there is when you have such a clear objective, which does relate directly to the community and the community at large, then some of the differences that different leaders might have tend to be seen in starting from a shared purpose around, yes, this is what we want to achieve. We might have a different view about how to get there, but it seems to then that seems to have helped take the politics out of it a little bit because the, your starting point is something that you actually agree on. Um, and then the differences seem relatively small, I guess, in, in the sense of if it's a case of which path you go, um, then people will say, well, that's legitimate that you might have different issues there. Um, I think the other thing that stands out to me, and, um, you know, you've, you've both mentioned the sort of optics of this, the conflict that normally sits around COAG, is that you see the conflict on the way in, people go in, you don't really have a clear sense of what the objective of the meeting is, and then you come out and you get this communique that everyone kind of owns but doesn't really own. Um, whereas I feel this time around in the National Cabinet, you're getting a meeting, everyone knows what it's, what's up. Um, the Prime Minister comes out and talks about what the outcome was. Um, and the outcome is genuinely about we reviewed how we're travelling, we need to make this shift or we don't. And I think the fact that they're, they're showing agility as well is something, it's, again, mm. clear to the objective. But then the premiers go and say, yes, we're on the same direction, but we're going to do this a little bit differently in our state. So you get the, the prime minister owning it very clearly and you get each premier own, owning their bit when they go back home as well. And I think, you know, virtually go back home. And, and I, from my perspective, I think that's been a really significant kind of visual distinction, if I can put it that way. So you see that um, and you see that reported because it's a crisis. It's, it's getting it's getting reported, you know, and. Nothing rates as highly as as, as a crisis, and and particularly the COVID nineteen crisis we've got at the moment. But but that general point you've made, um, and it goes to mine earlier, when when your national body um, has a clear purpose and agenda, that's when it works best. And the national reform agenda, you know, it, it wasn't a big crisis, so it wasn't you know it, sexy in a, in a media sense. But the truth is, um, many of the biggest reforms that were made in that human capital area 
um, you know, in education, investing in um, early childhood education, early intervention, uh, in the closing the gap agenda. Again, um, looking at that very early intervention, supporting mothers, um, reducing um, natal fatality rates, um, uh, birth birth rate. Um, all of all of those things came out of that national reform agenda, and uh, clear purpose jurisdictional flexibility, but of course the other thing that we had with the National Reform Agenda uh, was the COAG Reform Council, which was an independent body um, measuring the progress against the KPIs and objectives. Um, and unfortunately that was abolished by Prime Minister Abbott in I think 2013, um, but I think that was a great loss for Australia because um, what gets measured matters. And, and I think you see that in the closing um, the gap agenda. In some areas there's improvement, but in way too many areas there's not enough improvement. And I think um, that agenda would be better served too by an independent body measuring the um, initiatives that have been taken and the progress made against them. Uh, but I hope if there's a, a future federation reform agenda, again, it'll be clear it will be agreed by the National Cabinet. There will be clear, very clear purpose and objectives, and there will be independent measurement along the way to see how progress is tracking. Yeah, I think um, anyone who's heard me speak on um, progress against Indigenous outcomes uh, in this country will know that I get on my soapbox about um, the lack of evaluation and the lack of, um, I mean, there's, there's clear objectives, but the, the evaluation and, tr and transparency of reporting against those and also allowing agility as we learn on the way through in these complex issues, which so many of the COAG partnership agreements don't actually allow for is, is, a, is a real problem, I think. Mm. Um, Jenny, the current National Cabinet, um, is it fit for purpose to, to continue on in the way that it's currently designed? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it's very early days and hopefully some people are doing some thinking behind the scenes. Um, but at the moment, it's still suffering from those kind of critical defects that we've identified before. Um, it's called, controlled by the Commonwealth and it's now become some peculiar subcommittee of the Commonwealth Cabinet, which is kind of not a tenable thing. And I don't know how that's going to work. Um, I think, and, and, and this is to the point that John's talking about, um, there's still no, I still have no greater clarity about what the agenda is going to be. So what constitutes a national issue? So what the national, once we get through the COVID-19 crisis, um, how it's going to work that it'll operate differently um, from it, from the way it did before. I've got, I've got, a, I've got a cunning idea. Um, I think I think because I do I, I am worried about the concern and the, the lack of time that people have together as a cohort to actually undertake an agenda. And I think well, Queensland's the last state that's gone on to a four-year fixed term. I think that presents a real opportunity um, for the states and territories all now have a fixed four-year term. The Commonwealth's the only outlier is to actually have kind of like an election period every four years. So you know, from March to June or something, where all the states and territories have their election during that time. So then you have the opportunity for the same cohort to have to be in the National Cabinet for four years. So you could have a four-year agenda. You could do the timing of all the health agreements, all of that stuff to go through. And it just brings, it, it takes out that kind of constant chopping and changing as people and personalities change. So it will give you a four-year run um, at actually getting a bit of a strategic go at what you wanted the National Cabinet to do. John, that sounds very neat and tidy, doesn't it? I can see yeah, no. you making your head. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure about that. and Because then you have... Yeah, and then you do that for a few years and then have an election and they change all the governments because they didn't like what was done in the last four years. I'm not sure about that, Jenny. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I think, but I would say I agree with many of the other things that Jenny has said on this. And I think to make, you know, at the moment the National Cabinet, as I've said, is working spectacularly successfully and, and that's what the public would say as well. But is it going to be fit for purpose in the long term? Not without, not without some rules put in place. And I'm, and I'm sure they're looking at these things. 
They do need a code of conduct. Um, sounds like a silly thing to say, but, you know, boards boards have these, you know, sporting clubs have them, I, I, you know, um, media organisations have them. Um, but, you know, the only people who really sort of don't, or if they do, they don't comply with them very often is um, politicians, need a code of conduct. So those are things like um, the culture, um, the language, uh, w- whether you chest beat and bag the Prime Minister on the way into a national meeting, all of those things would get covered by a code of conduct. Um, it needs an independent secretariat. Uh, I've been prattling on about this for years and years and, you know, and Jenny Ditto and other sort of experts in this space, if it's to work properly, it needs an it so that it's not becoming a plaything again, of a, of a particular prime minister of the day. Um, most importantly, it needs a clear forward agenda. You know, I can't stress that enough. They've, they've got to have things on their agenda every quarter or every six months that uh, major elements of policy that this is what the national cabinet is going to tackle and resolve. And, and the fourth thing is an independent monitoring body. You know, I've got strong, strong view. You know, what, as I said before, what gets measured matters. Not everybody trusts politicians. This is a big thing around the world now where people don't, you know, it's the whole fake news stuff. So um, people say, oh, of course, they're going to say they've done the job well, you know, because they're politicians. You need, you need an independent body that will measure the progress that's being made. So I think you need those four key elements. Um, and you could probably add some of the other protections that Jenny added in. So I've got a question here from Nick in the audience who is, is basically sort of saying, okay, we've got National Cabinet announced, we're going to replace COAG. Um, is, it, is it just a renaming and a semantic exercise? And I think in a way this kind of goes directly to the two issues that the two of you, the, sorry, the issues that the two of you were just speaking to. And I think it goes straight to the question of trust um, around government officials. I think we've seen trust, I suspect, improve at the moment, partly because of the, the frequency and the transparency and the focus on reporting. But is, is this just, an, I guess it kind of comes back to my question before, John, you know, Ren, is this, is this just another crisis exercise? And, and can, you know, can we really, should we really be hopeful that we're going to, we're going to see a, something like a, a functioning COAG, whatever we call it in the future? Yeah, but just, just to be, just to be clear and, and brief, I hope, um, uh, it, it's a fit for purpose body at the moment, absolutely fit for purpose. You know, you couldn't have designed it better in terms of taking a national approach. I think, as we said before, evidence-based policy, bring all the leaders together, clear goals and objectives, jurisdictional flexibility, um, good good culture uh, between the leaders. So it's got all those elements, um, but that's not gonna, you know, the, the crisis will end uh, at some stage and they'll move on to harder, and, and on the one extreme and other areas, more mundane issues. Um, so they'll need those things that Jenny and I have been talking about. You know, they'll need that independent secretariat. They'll need that forward agenda. You know, we still haven't got, um, um, you know, there's, no, there's still no national agreement in relation to the environment and climate change. I mean, if you, if you want to pick the one issue which has bedeviled Australia now for more than a decade, it's this sort of windscreen wiper approach to climate change and environment policy. And we just haven't tackled, you know, it's been a complete failure of leadership in Australia. So a federation, national cabinet is, is the best place to start and put that together to get a single national approach uh, which I think inevitably is going to involve at some stage a price on carbon, and that's a difficult issue for some people in politics. But the Federation Cabinet or the National Cabinet is the best place to start. But it needs it needs those key elements. Anything you wanted to add to that, Jenny? Yes, I, th- I think a way to differentiate COAG from the, the National Cabinet and to actually show that it has fundamentally changed is to take all those issues that John was talking about before and have a formal intergovernmental agreement between all the states and territories in the Commonwealth around how the National Cabinet will operate, what is a national issue, um, establish the independent secretariat, those protocols that you're talking about, those codes of conduct. And I think that that would actually demonstrate to people, look, this is not COAG, we have a whole different set of operating principles and this is what we'll stick to. I think that might be the way forward. Yep. So here's... Here's an unsurprising question for you on this topic. 
Um, and it's going to, uh, it, it's the it's the usual one around how many levels of government, and is it time for just two two levels? Should we keep keep running the way we are, or would a two tier national plus local slash regional? So get rid of the states, former premier. What do you think? Uh, no, I mean, and people who say this, so are we over governed? Um, maybe. Um, lots of people around the world, you know, literally uh, die for the opportunities and the freedoms of the democracy which we enjoy. Um, so, you know, we're, we're over governed to the extent that we have conflicting regulations or too much red tape. And those things, I think, are eminently solvable through a proper national cabinet approach. Um, where you can set, if you like, a regulation reform agenda. You can have an independent monitoring body to oversee progress against it. So you're not going to abolish the states. You need a majority of voters in a majority of states. That's like never get, never going to happen. So let's make three levels of government work well. Jenny? Oh, I agree. Um, and research actually shows that compared to other jurisdictions, uh, Australia is it overgoverned. Uh, the Timmy Withers report, which John would know well, which is on the Council for the Australian Federation website, uh, looked at this issue, and really, it's a bit, it's a bit of a myth that we are overgoverned. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think mean, I've had this conversation so many times. I'm in John's John's camp. I, I think it's you, you're far better off expending your energy figuring out how to make it work better because. Which, which level of government is ever going to agree to be abolished? <laughs> and that's a pretty big barrier, I would have thought. Um, Tim, Tim, through the Q&A, has asked about uh, how critical funding arrangements are, and particularly federal funding is um, in actually getting agreement uh, and incentivising the states. And that's a pretty important issue as we go into the, the next year, understanding where deficits are going to be around the country. John? Yeah, no, I mean, funding funding's crucial. So if you look at, you know, big issues, and health is obviously the biggest one, um, where for some state governments now, the health budget's consuming close to a third of their total budget. I think in a couple of states, it's probably over that now. So what happens with the Commonwealth Agreement in, in health is crucial to states. Um, and in health, the truth is, no matter how efficient you are, um, the high probability likelihood is that health costs are going to continue to increase at a rate greater than the consumer price index. So they're going to keep chewing up more and more of the budget. So it's going to be a shared partnership. So money money is crucial. And that really, you know, this issue of tax reform, it, it hopefully it will come back uh, on the agenda. I don't think it's going to come back on the agenda in the next few months because I think people's hands are full with more immediate crises. But going forward... Uh, this issue of vertical fiscal imbalance, VFI as we call it, you know, the states, for every $2 the states spend, they're getting more than a dollar from the Commonwealth. They're, they're tied to the chariot wheels of the, the Commonwealth. Um, GST was meant to resolve that, uh, but the GST hasn't been the rivers of gold uh, that former Treasurer Costello said that it would be. And in fact, it's been a declining real share of revenue. Um, so uh, tax reform is hard. Uh, you know, the, the, the right answer and the best answer for Australia is to increase the GST. Uh, but politically, that's extraordinarily um, challenging. And, um, you know, you, you've seen no appetite for that at federal level or indeed at, amongst uh, some of the current state premiers. Uh, but we're way, you know, we're way underweight in terms of consumption tax. We're more reliant on income tax today than we were before Prime Minister Howard uh, introduced the GST uh, in 1999. So this burden on people through income tax is going to become more and more crushing. Um, so we do need tax reform. And again, it's a great example. Tax reform can and won't happen um, without um, the agreement of the states. Yeah, and I, th I think health, as well as you spoke to earlier, is, I mean, you You've got to get the right incentives, um, and the way the system is structured at the moment, you know, dollars and how you figure out the allocation of those is critical to getting any reform. Because otherwise, you you just get too many perverse incentives um, working their way through the system that pop out down the track. <laughs> um, Jenny, can I ask you uh, a question that Theo's presented uh, through the pigeonhole, which is 
whether or not there is a need for any constitutional reform um, in regard to resetting the Federation to get it to operate effectively? Um, look, that's a tricky one. Um, most of these issues are silent in our constitution. So that's why we've, we've kind of managed them as we go. Oh, I've got two thoughts about the constitutional reform. Um, it's very hard to get up to begin with, and, and and because then it's so hard to change, you get a bit of a kind of a, a, a frozen situation. So if some kind of ongoing um, intergovernmental forum went into the constitution and circumstances and times changed, I think it would you would lose the flexibility and the adaptability um, to change the situation as you went. So my inclination would... Uh, it wasn't initially in the constitution. I think something like an intergovernmental agreement, which could be updated and amended as our federation evolved, would be better than the constitution. Thanks, Jenny. John, did you? I don't, you don't. I, you don't uh, need to weigh just, in on that. But <laughs> no, I mean, the, just changing the constitution is extraordinarily difficult. Um, I was in the federal parliament. I was a backbencher for Bendigo when um, the then Hawke government. I think it was um, 88, put up the proposals for, you know, recognition of local government um, in the constitution, um, four-year terms, simultaneous elections. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought surprisingly controversial, but um, the, uh, the opposition decided not to support those. Um, and it was actually the late uh, Peter Reith who uh, ran a ferocious campaign against it and what were pretty innocuous proposals went down. It's it's notoriously difficult. And, and you know, and when you look at some of the proposals in terms of um, a stronger Indigenous voice, you, you've got to, you know, balance up um, issues about what you put in the Constitution with um, the likelihood of those being, you know, supported across a majority of voters in the majority of states, as we saw with the... You know, the Republic vote as well. Um, you know, it's very difficult to get constitutional change in Australia. Yeah, I, I, I share that view. Um, let, let me finish off just with one final question from um, Atria through the pigeonhole, and I'm going to link it to um, a theme that I think has come through strongly through John, but also I think in Jenny's comments as, as well. You, you both mentioned the timing, so we've just seen you know, much more frequent meetings of um, of the National Cabinet. John, you've uh, made reference um, a couple of times to, uh, you were know, sort of comparing how COAG or Cabinet might operate with how a, a typical board would function, whether it's not-for-profit or a corporate board. And, of course, most boards would meet every month, every two months. What's the what's the right rhythm and, and if you've, you know, and sort of broader governance structures around that sort of when do you meet and are you, do you think it's, it's like a board, John, or what, what, what's your view on that? I think it is like a board, and um, I don't want to try and corporatise government, uh, but, uh, the, but um, and, and politics is different. You know, politics is a, is, it's, a, it's a public issue. We live in a very live and vibrant democracy. So, you know, I'm not... Um, you know, I understand, I understand these issues having been a player in the system, but nevertheless, uh, I think getting the culture right, the behaviours right, is is a crucial and continuing requirement for our political system. And we've seen that with some issues, to be blunt, you know, recently in Victoria, um, and, you know, they're, they're political issues, but they're also issues about culture about people's behaviour and people's language and how they relate to one another. And the political class still seems to be out there in a sort of world of its own. Um, and it is on both sides of politics, don't get me wrong, uh, very much on both sides. But um, behaviours are important. The way people relate to each other are important. The respect they show each other are important. Again, I've written about how the parliament works and question time and the adversarial nature of it, which feeds a culture which I don't think is appropriate for the modern day. So I'm I'm big on codes of conduct, getting behaviours right and getting cultures right. And um, you see that more often in the boards of not-for-profits and companies than you do at 
cabinet level across governments in Australia. Jenny, how about, uh, how about your thoughts on that and timing and what sort of yeah. rhythm I, we might introduce? I think there's a lot of advantages to more uh, frequent meetings. The, the one or two meetings a year, the, the co agendas are really, really long. So, you know, what kind of proper deliberation are you, are you going to be giving to it? Um, I think if you have more frequent meetings, you can actually get into um, one-issue meetings. So you could spend the entire meeting looking at, like, tax reform you know, the GST, something like that, which I think is the way that the that our political leaders would rather uh, manage these issues. Instead of being swamped by the bureaucratic processes, they sit down for an entire meeting and talk thoroughly through an issue like that. And um, I also think um, it does build the respect that John was talking about. If you're meeting the same people in a regular way as they are now, you don't see them as just political opponents or whatever. You actually do build a more uh, cohesive way and a sensible way of working together. Yeah, I mean, as a like John, I um, I sit on a couple of boards, both corporate and um, not for profit, and have done over the years. And you know, a lot of the points that you made, John, I think really resonate. And and likewise, Jenny, your points just then. If you you know if you if you meet regularly, if you get to know each other. Um, if you've got a clear set of expectations around um, what you're trying to achieve, um, how you should behave together, um, not surprisingly, it's sort of conducive to better decision making, I think. Um, that's all we've really got time for. We've got a bunch of other questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to them. We'll, we'll try to get some feedback and some responses to participants who put those questions in and, and get that back to you when we email after the event, which will include also a link um, to this recording as well. Um, I think just to sort of wrap up for me, the, the really strong themes that have come through are around the clarity of objectives, the shared objectives, this, and, and not 25 of them, <laughs> um, just clear objectives that align with the interests of the broader community, having an agenda, um, you know, thinking about accountability, being clear about accountabilities and, and you know, this point about what, what's the culture and how do we properly engage for the sake of, um, you know, of good decision making. John, you also mentioned strategy and, and just as a sort of final observation, I remember actually sitting on a board with someone um, who was on the management of the organisation who had worked um, for a politician, for a minister, and I said to them, what's the biggest difference that you found going from politics to corporate life. Um, and he said the amount of time spent on strategy um, and that in, in the business, the amount of time dedicated to, you know, clear air and time to think about strategy. And so perhaps if we sort of close on that, I think some of the questions that remain are about who essentially who sets the strategy, who sets the priorities and who sets the strategy. And so I think maybe that's a nice place to close out that the, the observations from some is that there's not enough um, time given to that in government and politics, and and maybe that's the starting point as you know for for everything else that follows. Um, thank you for joining us, John, uh, Jenny. Really enjoyed the conversation, and obviously greatly appreciated your insights and the experience that you've brought to this conversation. Um, can I thank the audience um, for participating today as well? Um, as I said at the outset, we're really appreciative of the amount of interest and engagement that people have had in CEDA's agenda. Um, you've jumped into these live streams just as quickly as we have, um, and we're glad that, that um, so many participants and viewers have enjoyed them. Um, in addition to our live streams, um, we're also doing a whole bunch of other work to get content onto our website um, to address the issues that are front and centre for people, particularly through this COVID-19 crisis, whether it's the impacts on the health system, uh, the impacts that, they, that relate to the economy and business um, or to our society more broadly. Um, we've got blogs, um, we've got a range of different podcast series that we've been putting out. So if you found today interesting or any of, other, any of our other live streams, um, you might want to jump onto the website and check out some of the broader content um, that we're producing. Um, you'll also find information about our upcoming live streams. So if you want to participate in any of those in the future, um, just check out cedar.com.au. Um, and with that, it's just my uh, great pleasure to thank um, our speakers again for joining us and to say good afternoon. Thanks, Melinda. Good afternoon.